Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Retalk Series webinar. This is Mabel Gu from Leader Associates, the organizing committee of Australia Wind Energy 2021. I feel very honored to host the second webinar of this event. Firstly, I'd like to introduce the theme of today's webinar, exploring Australia's massive offshore wind potentials. Australia is going to be a most promising market for offshore wind development and operation with abundant resources and the up upcoming new regulatory framework to enable offshore clean energy projects. In addition, with the launch of the national hydrogen strategy, offshore wind power could be a perfect complement to a green hydrogen industry in this country. The webinar is set up to help international companies to have a comprehensive understanding of Australia's offshore wind market. Furthermore, we'd like to share the latest trade issue and innovation with a large number of domestic players. And please kindly find the agenda of today's webinar on this slide. I'm pleased to have Mr. Simon Curry from Energy Estate and uh, Mr. Daniel Malo from Society General speaking at the webinar. Please note that each speaker has 20 minutes for the presentation and the following five minutes for Q&A session. We will show a few questions selected from the pre-registers on the slide. If the time allows, one or two questions from live audiences will be answered by the questions orally as well. Next, I would like to introduce my company, Leader Associates, to all of you. Leader Associates is the leading global renewable energy event organizer. And you can see our strong track records and partnerships across five continents from the slide. Finally, we would like to give some tips to our audience. If you have any technical issues, you can use the chat box at the bottom of your screen. And if you have questions to speakers, please use the Q&A box next to the chat box. Speakers can answer your questions online. And there are five to 10 minutes will be left for each speaker to orally answer per registers questions. And don't worry about the slides and the recordings. They will be shared by email link within one week after this webinar. And let me introduce the first speaker, the Simon Curry, principal from Energy Estate. Simon is a principal as energy at Energy Estate, an advisory and accelerator business focused on the transformation of the energy sector. Simon was at the forefront of the development of the offshore wind sector in Europe, including many of the first projects in different countries. He is committed to the development of the offshore wind sector in Australia and the wider APAC region. Simon is recognized for his innovative approach to driving local content and the regional economic development outcomes. Simon will speak on the Australia offshore wind energy potentials. And Simon, could you please share your screen now? Hello? Hi, no problem. Yes. So just share the screen and move on. How's that, Mabel? Yes, I'm here. It's locked, it's locked good. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be um, here. Uh, I've been told not to put my video on, so you can't actually get to see me today, um, which is probably no bad thing. Um, for any of you who, any of those who know me, I am wearing a loud floral shirt, um, which is uh, one of the things I'm known for. Uh, to just give you a, a little bit more background uh, as to why I feel qualified to, to speak um, on this topic, uh, 
I've only been in Australia for five and a half years. Uh, for 17 years, I was based in London. I was very fortunate to be involved at the very beginning. I go back to the days of North Hoyle and Barrow, uh, when we really, none of us, uh, including Vestas and um, all of the other people involved, really knew what we were doing with offshore wind at all. Uh, I then graduated to projects like London Array, um, near shore projects in the Netherlands, uh, spent a lot of time traveling the world um, with various people to Korea and the US and Japan, uh, talking about uh, what went wrong and what we didn't, the lessons we learned in Europe. Uh, and then in 2017, I was at the first of the Asian offshore wind events in Taiwan. I walked into the room and it was delightful to see so many of the old hands uh, from around the world as we started on the journey uh, in uh, Asia. Uh, and for me, when I left Europe, I really thought I was leaving offshore wind behind and that maybe in 10 years time, it might have got to the APAC region. Um, how wrong was I? And what we've seen uh, is this incredible industry, uh, which took a while to grow up and we had a lot of growing pains. Uh, we have actually shown how we've come of age and what we've done in Taiwan and the companies who their first time outside Germany has actually been to Taiwan. Um, and we've seen you know, an, an incredible amount of investment and success already. Uh, and now we've got Japan, Korea, um, you know, as you know, exciting new markets, uh, Vietnam, and then the newer markets, uh, Philippines, India, and Australia. So that sort of hopefully gives you a bit of um, background. Um, I'm going to keep this quite high level. Um, so, so what does the Global Wind Atlas tell us? Uh, this is uh, at 150 metres. Uh, it tells you Australia is obviously pretty large. Um, the, you know, the offshore wind resource uh, in the west um, and then right along until you get to Victoria and Tasmania is strong uh, and then starts to really taper off as you leave uh, New South Wales. Uh, what, how does this compare to the rest of the world? And again, at 150 metres, um, you've, you know, it, it isn't as dense as what you have uh, in the case of the um, North Sea um, and all, all of the places where we began. Uh, but the flip side is it, you don't have anywhere near the density of shipping lanes, of other, other uses. Um, you know, the, the fun games we had in the North Sea around pipeline crossing agreements. Uh, I don't know how many pipeline crossing agreements I had to negotiate and be involved in, uh, but it was dozens. Uh, and it is a very densely populated area in terms of other alternative uses in the North Sea, uh, which is why it's quite incredible when you look now at the level of development um, and that people like, you know, Sok Jen and Daniel will talk about what they have done. And, you know, it is actually quite a, a relatively small area. Uh, one of the joys of Australia uh, is we have a lot more space to play in, uh, which will mean um, we may be more remote, um, but we also will not have the same issues. If you look at Japan, uh, Japan is being talked about that Japan can actually have independent energy independence for the first time ever, because with its offshore wind resource, it could produce 800% of its energy needs, uh, which is, you know, a stimulating topic for discussion in terms of will Japan be able to exploit its resources uh, to that level. Uh, but it, you look at the resource and it's good but it actually doesn't compare with Europe's or with um, Australia's. US, uh, interesting. It's, you know, again, uh, you know, very strong. It shows you how also how strong that uh, US onshore resources, um, which is in the, in the, in the centre, which is, a, you know, again, an absolutely world-class resource. Uh, it also shows you that, uh, we, you know, I expect there to be very significant amounts of development in the US um, on the West Coast, uh, as well as the East Coast. And we know when you look at the onshore resource on the East, on the West Coast, it's pretty average, which is another reason why we will see 
and that together with social license, which I'll talk a lot about, um, and we'll see what we go with offshore. And where else? Well, you know, Vietnam's really interesting, a huge amount of activity, uh, very interesting um, ability to coordinate with the um, existing uh, offshore industries there, the oil and gas industry and the steel industry. Uh, it's not evenly distributed, uh, as you can tell from the map. So there are parts of Vietnam where offshore will be challenging. Um, the other thing with Vietnam, which is getting everyone quite excited, is the fact that the, you know, there's been, what, 15 of the 16 coal plants which were anticipated to go ahead are now stalled. Uh, and even the LNG projects are slowing up. So in terms of creating a window for offshore wind, uh, if you'd asked me two or three years ago, I'd have said Vietnam was years away, but we've now already seen CIP and Orsted and others start to enter the market. Uh, Korea uh, has always been seen as a very strong resource uh, and the industry has built up there. Um, you know, I've said I've traveled there many times over the last few years to look at how both you develop the turbine industry and the local players. And then if you want to go somewhere really windy, and as you can tell from my funny accent, I'm actually originally from New Zealand. Uh, New Zealand has one of the best resources you could possibly imagine. Uh, it's a relatively small market. Uh, but we're certainly expecting that over the next, you know, um, 10, 20 years, New Zealand will develop offshore as part of its renewable exports plan. The next map I'm showing you, which um, I haven't managed to put the two of them on top of each other, but uh, as to what's the existing transmission infrastructure. Uh, and that's really important in Australia. Uh, I thought doing projects in Bulgaria was difficult. Uh, when I was in London, because it was the most difficult, dealing with NEK was, I thought, the most difficult grid experience in my life. Uh, Australia makes uh, Bulgaria look like a walk in the park. Uh, so one of the advantages of um, offshore wind is the fact that Australia's grid is right around the outside. And the strength of the grid um, is, you know, as you, know, you look at down in, as around, in and around Perth, uh, particularly around existing industrial hubs. So you've got places um, such as Port Augusta, um, Adelaide, which again used to have major heavy industry in Adelaide, um, Portland down in um, the bottom of Victoria, uh, you know, Gippsland where the coal-fired power stations are, Newcastle where you have a smelter again, Gladstone where again you have another smelter, uh, the minute the, we Australia may have fabulous onshore resources, but they are in many cases a long way away from the existing grid. And per kilowatt hour, the grid infrastructure costs in Australia are very significant. So for offshore wind, which is one of the, it's a different situation than, than if you look at Europe, uh, you end up, for offshore wind, you might be 30 or 40 kilometres offshore with the additional costs of dealing with off offshore. But you would connect directly into one of the key nodes, which would be a very different situation than doing a one gigawatt onshore project, which may have fantastic resource. Um, so if you look at the blue line that goes up from Victoria um, into New South Wales uh, to Broken Hill, there was plans for a one gigawatt wind farm there, which was eventually scaled down to 200 megawatts and is currently constrained a lot of the time, which is one of the reasons why I think offshore wind will actually have a major part to play in Australia because we will be able to locate projects much closer to the existing transmission infrastructure. So, Star of the South. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Aaron um, from Star of the South uh, won't be here today. Um, so I'm not gonna try and uh, steal a lot of Aaron's thunder, um, other than to say that uh, I'm actually the, uh, the, the, it's my fault that um, CIP uh, were introduced to um, the original developers who rang me up about four years ago and said, do you know CIP, who are they? Um, do you think they should be in our list of potential partners? Uh, to which I made sure they understood that CIP was one of the leading players in the world. 
uh, and the rest is history. Uh, this is the first major um, project that's been proposed here. The original developers, so, um, you know, Terry Callis and Andy Evans, um, came up with the concept uh, and did a lot of the you know, early um, pre-feasibility work, as well as getting the lining up the stakeholders. Um, you know, this is Australia is a very easy place to work in terms of your ability to engage with stakeholders. Uh, but there's also state and federal stakeholders who you need to manage. Uh, so this project is moving ahead uh, you know, very quickly. Um, I touched base with Erin before the um, session and you know, she said to remind everyone that you know, there's been very strong state and federal government support. Uh, we've just in the budget which was announced last night, there is, uh, I think it's around 4.8 million to set up the off, uh, bespoke offshore regulatory regime for offshore energy, uh, which, which really reflects um, how the government has gone about trying to encourage uh, offshore wind uh, over the last few years. One thing which will surprise you if you don't know Australia is we have a serious issue with social license for onshore renewables. Uh, my son is learning to drive at the moment, and I got back yesterday night from three days driving 1,300 kilometres in a loop from Sydney. I saw one wind farm and no utility scale uh, solar farms in that drive. I could pick dozens of countries around the world uh, and go for that sort of drive or even scale it down into scale, do it to scale for the size of the country. And I would see a lot more onshore development. Uh, that's not because the resource in Australia is rubbish. It's a lot to do with social license. It's also a lot to do with the fact of how much coal we still have on the bars. So we're only starting now in places like New South Wales really to develop scale of renewables. But when you look at um, you know, Star of the South, um, also, the onshore wind um, is not very strong there. So, um, what and but the offshore wind is great. Uh, so it's not an area where there will be large scale on onshore wind development. Behind um, you know um, those Port Albert and Yarram uh, is where the Latrobe Valley is, which is where the you know, was four now three brown coal power stations are operating, which provide most of the power for Victoria. Uh, they will retire sooner rather than later, uh, which again creates quite a big window for Star of the South. Now let's go to the other side. Um, and many of you may have heard uh, about Pilot Energy. So Pilot Energy is a junior oil and gas explorer listed on the Australian Stock Exchange who has proposed a new onshore and offshore wind and solar project. Uh, the, this picture gives a good view of their license. So this is a undeveloped petroleum license that they have, uh, which covers all of the area shown in brown. I think it's, num no, it's 481 from memory. Uh, this is a world-class uh, offshore wind resource together with a potential to look at onshore and teaming up with people onshore uh, to develop a very large new offshore wind hub. Uh, there is uh, uh, some offshore oil and gas uh, infrastructure, there is onshore infrastructure, there is gas pipelines, there is the existing electricity transmission line, and there is the ability to support the growing green hydrogen industry the Western Australian government has just called for an expression of interest for a um, new uh, industrial facilities at Okaji. Okaji for many years was going to be the site of a new um, export port for um, magnetite. So it was going to be an iron ore export project. What they're now looking is effectively harnessing the renewable resources to create not just green hydrogen, uh, and potentially export, but also looking at green steel. Uh, Australia is the largest current exporter of iron ore, uh, which for me means right now we're just ex exporting a lot of pollution at the world and to the rest of the world, 
without actually thinking about how we can do palletizing, let alone further processing. Uh, this is an industrial strategy and pilot with this license is gonna be right at the heart of it. And for me, this is really part of the future that we have uh, in my industry, in energy, we will be looking at repurposing. It's not just about just leaving the old industry behind, whether that's the people um, or whether that's the potential for the, you know, reusing the facilities or permits, which currently, you know, who would have thought that you would now be looking at permits in places like New Zealand, um, South Africa, Australia, Chile, and saying, let's repurpose those offshore permits to extract something else from the, the ocean rather than going under the ground. Uh, why don't I just touch on now um, corporate PPAs uh, and how I see them fitting in. So I've been at the forefront of the development of corporate PPAs globally from the first work that we did with World Business Council for Sustainable Development with EY. Uh, and I've been there many times when corporates have said no at 11.59. Uh, that for offshore wind, we're starting to see the corporates playing an increasing part. So we saw the world's largest ever corporate PPA, which for an offshore wind farm, the whole 920 megawatts being committed to um, the you know, semiconductor giant in Taiwan at a price um, below their long-term um, power price in Taiwan. Uh, and for a term of 20 years starting, many years from now. And that really is a game changer for the relationship between offshore wind and corporates. Uh, and this is where when we look at Australia and we look at the players who are here, the people like the BHPs, the Rio Tintos, the South 32s, the Alcoas, people who will still be here processing and producing in 20, 30, 50 years time. The offshore wind gives them that ability to buy very large scale volumes uh, over long periods. Uh, so I was, that was one of the reasons we, so many of us were very excited when we saw the Orsted announcement uh, and with what we're seeing across the region. I, I think one of the things which I like is when you look at the top corporates for PPAs, you look at who they are for 2020, you've got Amazon and Microsoft up there, but then you've got General Motors, then you've got Anglo, then you've got telecoms, then you've got Dow. Who would have thought that Dow would be doing this? Uh, then you've got the university sector who are playing an increasingly important role in Australia and other markets. Then you've got food with cargo, again, very relevant to Australia. Uh, so I, this is, to me, one of the, you know, the things to watch going forward and to think about is how you engage uh, these corporates uh, with your plans in Australia, but more broadly across the region. So let me finish with just a few dispelling some myths. So the idea is you, um, uh, is Australia too small? Uh, it's too small an economy. Well, I was looking last night, Australia is uh, three times the size of the economy of Belgium, um, twice and a bit the size of Sweden, um, two and a half times the size of Netherlands, all of whom have managed to, and then you've got Denmark, all of them who managed to support an offshore wind industry. In many cases, those countries don't actually even have an offshore energy industry in comparison to people like the UK, which had a very strong. There's not enough energy demand in Australia to support justify offshore wind. Why would you bother doing it here? So you know, the Australian market is, you know, sort of in the range of 40 terawatt hours today. Uh, that does not take into account all the potential growth of the market with the um, further processing. Uh, you'll have just seen uh, maybe in the last day that the federal government is supporting copper string. So copper string is the idea that we will do start to connect a large uh, mining centres in the north. Um, of Queensland uh, to encourage greater processing. 
there is huge potential demand in Australia, going back to what I mentioned about iron ore. Uh, we also need to work out how do we lower prices in terms of to encourage the smelters to, to stay. Um, so the idea that Australia doesn't have sufficient energy demand, okay, it's not connected like Europe. It's not as big a market as China or the US, uh, but it is a, you know, a very substantial energy market in itself. I think it's, it ranks in the, between uh, around 14th and 15th in terms of global energy demand. Um, it doesn't have the population growth of others, um, but it has the potential industrial demand growth. And let's not forget about data, where Australia has, is stable, it has very good data connections, uh, and there was an increasing growing, rapidly growing data demand, uh, which will drive data centres uh, who are one of the, you know, the major users of clean energy going forward. Australia is too far away from hubs to be competitive. How are we going to make offshore wind competitive here if the manufacturing hubs are in Europe um, and in other markets? For that, my answer is Australia is a major steel producer. Um, there will be an increasing focus on local content in Australia, which is a, a key issue for us all globally now. Um, the, you know, the idea that we are not competitive for um, you know, towers, nacelles, blades, um, is a matter of scale. We need to scale up the industry in Australia to both have greater local supply chains, uh, but shipping is not a major factor in the cost of offshore wind farms. Um, its logistics are important in terms of onshore logistics. Uh, Australia doesn't have an offshore energy supply chain or track record. Now, that's just plainly wrong. Now, we have challenges. Uh, we're not the most productive uh, offshore maritime market in the world. We have very, very high costs um, in places like the Bass Strait. Uh, so we will need to deal with that. But if you look at Western Australia, Western Australia has a well-developed offshore ecosystem, whether that's from the ecologists through to the engineers um, and the contractors, as well as many companies with experience. And some of those, many of those companies are now entering offshore wind, such as you know, BP, Equinor, Total. When you wander around Perth, it's like going to Houston. Everyone who you know in the oil and gas sector is there, and those companies are the ones who are now going to transition. And then why go offshore when there's so much land for onshore wind and solar? And that's where I really need to focus on social license. And that, you know, like it or not, Australia has, in many parts of Australia, there are problems developing the onshore and off, onshore wind and solar resources, which Australia's natural resources and abundant land would, in, would indicate you should be doing. Uh, it's a social license issue. Uh, and these things we know won't change overnight. Uh, we need to do better at sharing the benefits of uh, renewable energy and not just assuming that because it's renewable, everyone's gonna like it. The politics will change and people like the Farmers Federation are starting to come on side and see the benefits. But we will need to look to go offshore to effectively fully decarbonize and to capture the very best of the resources we have. So hopefully that goes a little way to dispelling um, some of the myths. So Mabel, that was my presentation. Would you like me to move on yeah. to the questions now? Yes, of course. Thanks a lot for your presentation, Sam. And uh, we will show the questions on the slide. Just wait a second. Okay, so there are four questions from our registers. The first one is, could you please extend more how offshore wind can complement the national hydrogen strategy? Great. Um, it's an uh, excellent question. And so just a bit of background. So I was at the launch of the World Hydrogen Council several years ago. Uh, my colleagues at the time thought I was crazy and said, what are you bothering? Nothing's going to happen in green hydrogen forever. And I'm like, mm, let's just wait and see. Uh, and Australia is very much at the forefront of what's going on. Uh, and the challenges for Australia in green hydrogen will be similar to what they are in offshore wind. 
uh, I believe that there is, um, you know, the, a lot of compliments and I would say the two things which I would focus on are location matters and the how how offshore wind can help with uh, capacity um, capacity factor utilization for electrolyzers and green hydrogen production facilities. So in terms of location, you want to look at the combination of offshore wind resources and the onshore facilities today and in the future. Uh, you know, it's um, we're not likely to jump straight to offshore hydrogen production, as has been mooted in Europe. Uh, have a look at what Tractable are doing. Uh, it's interesting. I don't see that to where we'll end up immediately in Australia. I think we'll be producing the electricity offshore and effectively then doing the hydrogen and on onshore facilities. So cantering around the country, um, you want to look at Victoria, uh, you want to look at Star of the South, uh, the onshore facilities which are there, in particular you've already got the Longford gas processing facilities and you've got the work that Kawasaki Heavy Industries have done around brown hydrogen and how that will be effectively a Kickstarter. Uh, you also want to look at Portland, uh, the existing aluminium smelter, and how you can transition that smelter um, and the use its uh, excellent location and node um, for green hydrogen production. I've mentioned Geraldton, where you have the Okaji hub contact, um, concept. You have people like, again, Terry Callis with Murchison and Siemens, and Terry Callis with Star of the South with what he's got onshore and how you can pair that with pilot energy to develop trains of hydrogen production and green steel. Uh, you look at Quinana uh, and what's uh, that existing hub uh, and effectively the world-class um, bauxite reserves which South 32 and Alcoa sit in uh, inland and how you can harness the superb winds off the co south coast but we need to be very careful around social license. Margaret River is a major tourist area, uh, and I don't see that that's something where effectively there's going to be wholesale support for having, um, as much as I love them, not everyone loves horizons covered in wind turbines. Newcastle is very interesting from a New South Wales point of view. Uh, there is a, you know, a traditional heavy industry. You have ammonia plants there already. You've got the smelters. Uh, you've got the power plants to be replaced. So Vales Point and uh, Araring, which are close to the coast. Uh, the challenges of whale migration, uh, we have managed to tackle that before. We also have uh, major um, uh, if air, air bases. Um, so Williamtown is one of the major bases in, the, um, in the Australia. And not all the pilots like the challenge of ducking in and out of uh, offshore wind farms. Uh, and finally, Tasmania, uh, where Again, onshore wind, it's, you know, Tasmania, as you'd have seen from the pictures before, have got, has got superb resource, um, but has got a very challenging social license. It's a relatively small place. Uh, how much more onshore wind can we cram into Tasmania uh, without effectively creating even bigger problems than we've got today? Tasmania has the beautiful combination of strong onshore and offshore resource to pair with the hydro to become a major industrial player. And with Bell Bay, when you go to Bell Bay and you see the existing industry there, it is just tailor-made for pairing. So I think offshore wind and hydrogen will be a perfect match here. Floating wind, uh, question two. So I spoke with one of the global leaders last night just to get their views on Australia. Uh, their view is that despite floating, uh, floating solutions ability to have a 100% local supply chain, Australia won't be a material target for a while. Now that's because they think there's plenty of onshore and nearshore potential, but they recognise that um, social licence is a big issue in Australia, so you might need to go further offshore. Uh, what they would like to see is an adequate regulatory regime, offtake price visibility and favourable long-term political views. Uh, we're certainly seeing the favourable political views. Uh, I'm not sure when this is, we're not really seeing offtake price visibility yet, um, but that um, was their view. 
my view is that the local content angle and the accessibility of local content for floating offshore, particularly things like the IDO solution, uh, means that I think it's going to happen here sooner than people expect. Uh, and that ability to really manufacture the floating solutions in Australia uh, and use the existing workforce and existing manufacturing base uh, means we could hear, see it happen much more quickly uh, and we'll get the cost reductions um, more quickly than we've seen in other markets because of scale. Grid issues. Uh, as I mentioned, this is not an easy place to connect. In fact, there are, you know, literally hundreds of millions of dollars of value have been, uh, have gone up in smoke, for lack of a better word, over the last few years because of uh, delays and increased costs around grid. Uh, we also have the uh, social license issues with transmission, which are severe and add delays. Um, one of the joys of offshore is once you've effectively um, you know, got your license, done your prospecting, you can lay your cables without necessarily having to go and get 400 people signed up to easement agreements. Uh, and that will be one thing which in Australia will be very welcome. Uh, we also, it'll be about connecting to the very strong parts of the grid, which are at the coast and in ports. Uh, so we've already had a number of grid companies talk to us about how do they accelerate offshore wind in order to get the connections to where they want the power to be rather than 400, 600 kilometers inland and they just don't know how they're going to get it to where they need it to be. And finally, cost trends. Um, so I was there in Europe when we you know, were sitting there and with governments going, you need this to get down. And we've got it down. And we've shown what we can do uh, with the right direction. Um, we are in a very competitive market now in Australia. We've just had Neo and announce a $44 Australia flat for 15 years for a South Australian onshore wind farm, which is a pretty competitive price. So that's, you know, 30 US. Uh, and that's effectively a without subsidy price. I believe we are heading very quickly for between 50 and 70 Australian for offshore wind for these first projects. Um, now that may seem uh, overly optimistic, but we just, we had no idea where we could get to. When I was doing London Array with 3.6 megawatt machines, um, you know, we couldn't see where the horizon was. Um, you know, and now, you know, 10 years on, we are at a third of the prices we were then, or even a quarter. Uh, so I remain extremely optimistic that we will have prices which make a difference. We do have cheap gas in Australia. Whatever gas we're going to be extracting will not be cheap. So you know, if you can be in that 50 to 70 Aussie range, then you will have a very competitive project for gigawatts of your offshore wind production. So hopefully um, that has got everyone excited. Um, and for you and those of you who are not in Australia, um, we would love to have you down here, um, but we won't be having anyone here anytime soon. Um, but people like me are on the ground and very happy to, to help. Hi, Maybe. Yes, that's, yes, that's... yes, I'm here. And, uh, and uh, we will select one question for you from the live audience. Is that okay? Sure. Okay, so uh, we select one question from the Bridget Widow Smith about uh, what programs has been made regarding the proposed offshore wind framework, which has consulted on earlier this year. What is the next step? Um, so yes, I, I mentioned that there was an announcement for um, in the budget overnight um, for uh, further funding for the uh, offshore wind for in terms of progressing the regime. So we're waiting to have the, um, the, you know, the results of the consultation um, be discussed more widely and that was in part tied with the budget announcements. Uh, there's generally been a, a very open engagement uh, around uh, offshore wind uh, with the regulators, uh, NOPSEMA, um, being you know, very helpful 
Uh, we asked, we were starting from scratch, which is why, you know, the work that Andy Evans and Terry Callis did was so important and that, you know, Aaron and the team at Star of the South have picked up and driven forward. Uh, so, you know, we're seeing very good progress. Uh, you know, we're expecting, um, you know, now that the budget's out of the way, which has obviously taken a lot of everyone's attention in Australia uh, in this post-COVID times, uh, that we'll now start to see an acceleration of the regulatory regime, uh, which is being helped as well by the ex you know, further interest from people like Pilot. Hello, Simon. Hi. Yeah. And, and so, yeah. 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 And happy, happy to go into to more detail, but I think I've probably taken all of my time now. <laughs> okay. So many thanks for your presentation and also your good answer. <laughs> and uh, okay, let's move on and. Uh, Move on to the next slide, and uh, let's welcome the second speaker during the webinar, the Mr. Daniel Malo, Head of Natural Resources in, and Infrastructure Asia Pacific from Society General. Daniel is responsible for Society General's natural resources and the infrastructure practice in Asia Pacific. The team's activities include conventional and renewable power, oil and gas, LNG, base and purchase metals, transportation and social infrastructure. Daniel has been involved in several important transactions in the renewable energy sector across the region, including the Formosa Stage 1 and the Formosa Stage 2, and uh, the Yunning and uh, the CXFD offshore wind farms in Taiwan, as well as the Akita offshore wind farm in Japan. They are the Five first, first offshore wind farms to be project financed in Asia Pacific, and he will be discussing on the lessons from Asia in financing offshore wind projects. Hi, Daniel. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mabel, uh, and good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure to be here today uh, and, and discuss this exciting uh, industry and, and sector uh, with you all. And I must say, I'm just as amazed as Simon is uh, at the speed of development um, in, in offshore wind in, in Asia Pacific. Four or five years ago, uh, offshore wind in Asia Pacific was barely a whisper uh, in, in conversations. Um, and today, it is on the verge of becoming a, um, a regional asset class. Uh, so it's quite remarkable uh, what has been achieved in relatively little time and what's on the horizon. So what I was proposing to do today is maybe talk a little bit about what's happening elsewhere in Asia. How relevant is it uh, to the prospects in Australia, if at all? And then talk a little bit about um, what's happening in the financing markets uh, for offshore wind um, and, and how can that be translated to, um, to Australia. Um, so maybe just a, a one minute introduction on who we are on page three. Um, so my name is Daniel Malo, I'm an energy banker. Um, uh, Mabel, if you could move down to page three, thank you. Um, there we go. Uh, I'm an energy banker at South Chan, Société Générale. Um, we have a very long-standing presence in the region here in Asia Pacific with teams in Sydney, uh, in Singapore, and in Hong Kong. Uh, this is what we do. Um, so we tend to win awards, uh, as, you, as, you, as you can see uh, on this slide. Uh, we're very focused on, on this sector, uh, and for us, it's part of a more global practice. On the next page, um, uh, just maybe a few highlights on um, how our institution um, stands with respect to commitments for the climate. Um, and, and this is just a, a snapshot of, 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 of our positioning. So clearly we are aligning our business uh, to, to be compatible with a no more than two degree global warming scenario. In practice, what does that mean? It means we very actively supporting the energy transition. Um, we're reducing our activity in fossil fuels. Uh, we have exited uh, the coal fired power and coal mining sector several years ago now. We have exited areas such as Arctic oil or oil sands. And on the flip side, we are committing uh, to help raise uh, 120 billion euros uh, by 2023 in uh, in the energy transition sector, a combination of uh, helping client raise green bonds and deploying 20 billion euros or more into renewable energy. 
Uh, what we try to do also is to be at the forefront of new technologies, uh, floating solar, uh, floating offshore wind, battery storage, etc. So this is how we are positioning our business uh, with respect to this broader trend uh, going on in the world. Uh, on page, uh, on the next page, uh, you will see um, our track record. Uh, and, and really, the takeaway here is that we're active um, in all offshore wind jurisdictions in the world. Um, uh, the, the top row uh, is what we've done in Asia, uh, what, we are do what we are doing and have done in Asia uh, to date. Um, so you, you can see there that we've done all the Taiwanese offshore wind projects, uh, Formosa 1, Formosa 2, uh, Yunlin, um, as well as the Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners Project, and, and there's more coming. And we've done the first project, offshore commercial scale offshore wind project in Japan, and I'll come back to that a little bit later. And we are currently advising uh, in Vietnam, which is a promising market that, that I will touch upon also. And, and that comes on top of what we've been doing in Western Europe, in the UK, in Belgium, in France, uh, in the Netherlands. So clearly this is a key area of focus uh, for us as an institution. So let's, let's talk a little bit about what's happening in, in other parts of Asia, uh, moving to page seven and starting in Taiwan. Um, uh, so on the next page, uh, Mabel, um, we'll see the journey, uh, there we go, in, in Taiwan. So it is a remarkable journey. Uh, two years ago, as recently as two years ago, there was a grand total of zero megawatts of offshore wind uh, on the construction in, in Taiwan. Today, uh, fast forward two years, um, there is in excess of 1,700 megawatts of offshore wind that are either in construction or actually even starting to operate. Um, so it started with Formosa 1, um, then it scaled up pretty quickly uh, with Yunlin uh, moving to 640 megawatts. Um, uh, so it's been a, a remarkable journey. Uh, on the next page, maybe we can talk about um, how Taiwan compares uh, to other jurisdictions uh, for a number of the risk factors or investment uh, criteria for offshore wind. What's specific about Taiwan? And here I try to list uh, some of the key, uh, the key factors and, 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 and put in perspective the uh, specific context around Taiwan. So first of all, uh, construction risk. Um, Taiwan is blessed, actually, uh, because um, the projects are relatively close to the shore. Um, for most of one, two to, two to four kilometers to the shore, so very close. Um, some of the other projects are a little bit further out, but not that much. Um, and they are also in, uh, in relatively shallow waters, uh, sometimes as shallow as 15 meters, 15 to 25 meters. So it's, it's, a, it's a long way from the, uh, the North Sea uh, or other jurisdictions that are more, a lot more challenging. Uh, so that is a good thing uh, from that standpoint. It, it makes, in general, uh, construction risk as more manageable uh, on, 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 on in the grand scheme of things. Um, uh, so that, that is a positive, probably, about Taiwan. Uh, Secondly, offtake. Uh, when, when we finance projects or when we invest in projects of this nature, we need to know who is going to buy the power and we need a solid contractual agreement, a power purchase agreement. Um, uh, that is, uh, in Taiwan, is relatively unusual. Um, you know, usually, and, and Simon has done a number of those, usually a power purchase agreement is as, as, as thick as a phone book. Uh, in Taiwan, very different um, legal context. The power purchase agreement is actually a very short form document, 10, 12 pages max. Um, and, and a lot of the content it, it is actually dealt with in, in, in the law. Um, so that is a little, a little unusual uh, for project finance bankers uh, to, to, get around, um, to get around this particular way of, of dealing with risk allocation. Uh, resource risk. Um, here, I think Taiwan has a, a, a strong wind resource in the Taiwan Strait. There is a bit more season, seasonality um, uh, than maybe in other more uh, well-trodden jurisdictions in Western Europe, but it's generally a, a, a strong resource, as a strong resource with, with some level of seasonality that is manageable. Um, O&M operations and maintenance. Uh, it's a new industry. 
it's a new industry in Taiwan. It starts from zero. So supply chain, marine services industry uh, have to catch up uh, a little bit with, uh, and there's been a transfer of knowledge uh, from other jurisdictions from, from Western Europe into Taiwan. It's in progress. It's going to continue and it's going to get accentuated as more local, localization requirements will, will, will emerge. Um, but it is an industry that had to, um, to really start from the ground floor up. And then finally, uh, one thing that is unique about Taiwan and that we have not experienced in, 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 the, in any of the European markets is some of the extreme weather, um, the extreme weather that, that can occur. Um, it, it's, it's a part of the world uh, where typhoons are, are very frequent, uh, almost annually. Um, and, and it is also prone to earthquakes. And so that is something that the industry will have to, to, to learn uh, with. Um, this is something that we, as an investor, as a lender, as a financier, we're trying to mitigate, mitigate and to address the uh, combination of insurance, liquidity in the structure, um, forecasting, you know, modeling around those events happening and then and, and making sure that we have buffers uh, in, in our repayment schedules, etc. So that's that's what's specific about Taiwan. Looking looking forward on the next page uh, in, in Taiwan, um, it's gonna be it's gonna continue to be an exciting ride. Um, the forward-looking pipeline is probably four to five gigawatts and more. Um, and that's on top of the 1700 megawatts that I mentioned earlier. Um, we really see global investors lining up uh, for this sector. Australians, Japanese, Europeans, North Americans. The, uh, Taiwan has been successful uh, in attracting equity capital from, from all over the world uh, to this industry. As I mentioned, the first project is now operating. Uh, Formosa 1 started operating late, late last year, so it is now a reality. Uh, those turbines are spinning. Um, and then the availability of financing will be key uh, for, for the sector to continue to develop. And what have we seen on that front in terms of financing? Uh, you know, Taiwan is, a, is an interesting uh, market from a financing standpoint in the sense that it's very liquid. A lot of, a lot of domestic banks in Taiwan, high level of liquidity uh, domestically, but very little knowledge of the asset class. Um, so, uh, so what we were faced with is really a, a difficulty initially to tap into that very abundant local liquidity because of the fear of the unknown. Um, none of the Taiwanese banks have ever financed an offshore wind farm in the UK or in Belgium or in Denmark. Uh, so for them, it was a brand new asset class. Um, and as a result, we have seen the pendulum tilt a lot more towards other financing sources, international banks, export credit agencies, um, rather than local banks. Over time, this might ride itself a little bit uh, as, again, more projects come into operation, more comfort gets derived from the ability to build those projects. But that, that's, that's what we've um, witnessed so far. Over time, it is also possible that a local institutional market will develop. Those assets are long-term assets, long-term projects, 20, 25 years. Uh, they, are an, uh, they are an ideal candidate uh, for long-term bond financing, especially once they're operating. Um, so the prospects for this market remain strong. Um, and let's maybe move now in the interest of time to Japan. On the next page, I have a, a case study uh, on, on Formosa 2. Uh, this is 378, 76 megawatts. Uh, this is a transaction for which we acted as financial advisor and lead arranger. But I'll let you look at that at your leisure in the interest of time. And let's move to Japan. Um, uh, two pages down. Um, so, uh, oops. Um, uh, Mabel, can you fill up the slide, please? Yep, please. One more. One. Very good. Thank you. So, so uh, Taiwan is a uh, move back up, please. One. Sorry about that. Very good. Uh, so while Taiwan is getting all the headlines, clearly other markets in the region are developing, and the next one in line is clearly Japan. Um, uh, Japan will be a, a, a very interesting market. 
it has the potential uh, to dwarf uh, Taiwan in size. Um, uh, so what will we? What are the key characteristics of the Japanese markets? Wind resource is very good. Um, Simon Simon covered that earlier. Um, there will be uh, local expertise. You know, a lot of the large, uh, the Marubenis, the Sumitomo Corps, uh, a lot of those large Japanese companies have invested heavily in offshore wind in Europe. So there's a there's a knowledge base uh, domestically, which was not the case at all in Taiwan. So that's also very uh, very conducive. The challenges will be, you know, seabed conditions, a lot more challenging. I talked about Taiwan, very shallow waters, way close to the shore. Japan's going to be a different story. Um, uh, much more challenging, uh, water depth much greater. Um, uh, so that, that would be one challenge. And then the other challenge is, is um, likely to be around the regulatory and the environmental side. Um, Fishermen, uh, very entrenched uh, industry uh, in Japan, uh, so that will require uh, some finessing uh, to, to have offshore wind uh, coexist with Japan. But it is clearly a, a sizable market. The first large scale tender is already in progress at 2,500 megawatts um, with bids due later this year. Further uh, on the horizon, Korea. Absolutely an, an interesting market, a uh, very good resource, as Simon mentioned, and uh, I would say potentially the market where floating solutions, floating offshore wind solutions will, will, uh, will, will come to their full development. India uh, is also a market uh, that is of interest um, uh, with potential on both the east and west coasts. Um, so maybe real quick on the next slide, uh, Mabel, uh, this is the very first um, offshore wind project uh, getting uh, on the construction, uh, getting financed and now on the construction in Japan. Uh, it's just of Akita Prefecture in the northwestern part of the country. It's 140 megawatt for the low, low price of 1 billion US dollars. Um, but that's just a fact of life in Japan. And it comes back to the question that was raised earlier about costs. Will costs come down? Yes, they will, but initially they're relatively high. Uh, it is a new industry. Um, there, you need more projects, you need more scale to amortize some of those fixed costs that are, uh, that are required in order uh, to launch uh, that industry. Uh, moving to another promising market that's maybe a little further afield on uh, two pages down uh, uh, on Vietnam. Um, so Vietnam uh, could, um, uh, one more page down please, uh, Vietnam uh, has the uh, potential to become the first market in ASEAN in Southeast Asia um, for offshore wind. Um, uh, what are the what are the positives? Uh, A, the fundamentals. You know, it's an economy that's growing rapidly, even these days. Uh, in in the midst of a pandemic, Vietnam is is the only large economy in Southeast Asia that's likely to post positive GDP growth. Um, and 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 past GDP growth has been seven percent, seven seven and a half percent. So so clearly positive fundamentals in terms of demand, demand for electricity. Um, the resource is very good, especially in the southern part of the country. Um, it's less exposed to extreme weather. Uh, Vietnam tends not to get the typhoons that the Philippines or, or, or Taiwan or even up here in Hong Kong we, we get at times. Um, uh, there is potential to build relatively close to the shore. Uh, so all those things are, are relatively positive and, and are conducive for investment. The challenges will be around the regulatory regime, um, and in particular, the revenue agreement, the strength of the PPA, termination, um, change in law, uh, the off-taker. It's a non-investment grade country. Uh, the country is raised double B. Uh, so it is a little bit of a more challenging investment destination. So we will see, uh, uh, we are currently advising on one large scale offshore wind farm. Phase one is 600 megawatt, but it could go up to 3,200 megawatts. Um, so it's gonna be a little bit of a balance between the fundamentals and the regulatory challenges. But I think over time this will right size and, and it could turn into a market of great interest. Um, Let's talk about financing um, a little bit. Uh, two pages down, what are the key investment considerations uh, for offshore, uh, offshore wind? Um, uh, Mabel, if you could move down to page 17, please. Um, one more, thank you. Um, 
to me, it's, it's three key areas, and that's whether you are in Taiwan or in Australia or in Vietnam, you need three key things um, in terms of, of investment considerations, a regulatory framework, uh, an, an appropriate risk allocation, and an efficient financing. Um, regulatory framework, what do I mean by that? I mean an energy policy um, that's clearly, clearly articulated, a, a transparent regulatory regime, um, and, uh, and, 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 and a level of revenue certainty and the quality of that power purchase agreement of that revenue agreement. So that's, that's one of the building blocks. The second building blocks is um, an efficient risk allocation. You know, early risk, early stage risks, permitting, gov governmental approvals, those need to be dealt with. Um, uh, partnerships are likely uh, to be the key. Those projects are sizable um, and, and they, they are likely to require partners uh, over time and then we need the right risk allocation uh, to mitigate construction risk. And, and then finally, we need an efficient financing. Um, those are long-term assets. You need a stable capital structure uh, reflecting the long-term nature of those assets. You need an optimized cost of capital for both debt and equity. Um, and I'll talk a little bit a little bit about disruptions in the financing markets, what's happening with COVID, how is it impacting or not, not impacting the availability of financing. Um, people tend to resort to project finance on the next page uh, to, to, to finance those assets. Those are some of the reasons. You know, project finance gives you uh, on, on the upper right side higher leverage and longer tenor uh, in terms of your financing. On the upper left side, it's non-recourse to the sponsors. Uh, it reduces the corporate financing burden, doesn't overburden the balance sheet. And then at the bottom, it, it, it's usually a good way uh, to find common ground uh, between partners that may have different objectives and different credit profiles. Um, let's move down two pages in the interest of time, Mabel, uh, to page 20. I'll skip this and go to 20. So the risks and mitigants, you know, when we, when we look at financing those assets, those are the key risks uh, that we are faced with. Construction, operating, environmental and social, resource, interconnection, markets, political and regulatory, and financial. And we're looking to mitigate all those risks. Construction clearly is the uh, phase of the project when the risk profile is highest. So it, it is all about the right contractual framework, an EPC contract, a multi-contracting strategy versus a single party. How do you deal with interface risk, um, the experience of the contractor, the liquidated, the liquidated damages uh, and performance obligations that you have and how do you mitigate cost of runs, et cetera. Um, interconnection will be, will be something um, to, to be looked at closely in the context of Australia. I mean, we've been quite active uh, in onshore wind and solar and interconnection can be tricky in the Australian market. So that, that will be, that will be, um, that will be a, a key area of risk. And then the, uh, I'll let you go through the list here, uh, but th those are some of the items that we're looking to cover off when we look at financing those projects. Uh, maybe moving to the next page on sources of funding. Where do you raise the money um, for, to finance those kind of projects? Those are the key sources, uh, four buckets really. Um, uh, well, three buckets really uh, for Australia. Uh, I put the multilaterals here, but those are more for emerging markets. Uh, so on the, on the left-hand side, uh, the, the export credit agencies, the ECAs, um, uh, the multilateral, the MLA, they tend to they tend to be more focused on emerging markets, so they will not be a factor in Australia, but they're likely to be a factor in places like Vietnam or India. Um, the banks uh, on on the right hand side, um, and squeeze there in the middle the bond market. Uh, so they all have pros and cons. Um, uh, starting with the export credit agencies, one of the things that we witnessed in Taiwan is the export credit agencies have been crucial. Uh, in, 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 in helping raise financing for the offshore wind sector. It is a little counterintuitive because usually we associate export credit agencies with uh, emerging markets um, and, and we tend to tap, uh, tap those contributors of financing to mitigate political risk. In, in, which is not really a, a consideration in Taiwan. Taiwan is rated double A minus, um, but they acted as a key liquidity enabler. Um, and I think that is something that's valuable and, and to be kept in mind in the Australian context possibly as well. 
the banks. Uh, the banks are clearly um, uh, very active. It comes down to what I was talking about in Taiwan. Uh, to me, the banks, the bank market bifurcates into international and local banks, and then it comes back to knowledge base, uh, experience for the offshore wind asset class. And there it will be interesting to see how it works out in Australia, where we have strong banks, uh, very entrenched in their domestic markets, but have been a bit less active uh, in, in offshore wind globally. So how much of a role will they, play, will they play? And then on the other hand, we have the international bank that have been very active in offshore wind, um, uh, that will supplement uh, that financing source. And the bond market is an interesting market, especially in, develop, in developed economies like Australia, high-grade high grade countries. It tends to be more of a refinancing market. Um, it provides long tenor, so very suitable for a long economic life asset, um, but it shies away at times from taking construction risks. I think I'm coming towards the end, so I, I, I might just touch quickly, Mabel, on page 23, which is um, which is really talking about uh, COVID-19, the pandemic. Let's skip this one. Very good. Uh, and and what, what's what's the impact? Um, uh, and and in my mind, there's three potential impact of of the pandemic: a short-term impact, a longer-term impact, and an impact on funding sources. Short-term impact, I think what we've witnessed is really disruption in, um, in, 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 in sourcing equipment, in, in, in construction processes, um, issues around delays, increased costs, and making sure there's liquidity available for projects. Um, the, 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 the problem of having sunset dates in your PPAs by which you have to be in service and, and those buffers become a bit more challenging if, you, if your construction gets delayed. And those are really short-term uh, impacts for projects that are either on the construction or about to start construction. To some extent, they are abating and, and there may be a lesser consideration for discussion here. I think the longer-term impact is more demand recovery. Um, demand has been down uh, as a result of reduced economic activity. How quickly will demand come back? How fully will demand come back? I think Asia Pacific will lead the way in terms of recovery, and, and hopefully that will bode well uh, for uh, continued prospects for the industry. And then finally, the impact on financing sources. Um, clearly, the financing markets have been quite disrupted. And the peak of the disruption is probably in the second quarter of this year, uh, with uh, more volatility in the financing markets. Banks are going through a difficult time. Uh, funding costs widening uh, for institutions. Um, having said that, I would say that the silver lining remains. And even at the peak of the crisis, um, the fact that capital remained av available for the renewable energy asset class in general, and for offshore wind in particular. Um, uh, we, we've done two transactions in, in Taiwan, offshore wind transaction in Taiwan, one that closed in February, arguably at the very beginning of the pandemic, and one that is about to get signed uh, in, in a few weeks, and that's gotten structured and, and, and really uh, um, approved over the course of the summer. None of that has been disrupted uh, by the pandemic. So I think the capital remains available. There might have been a premium uh, for financing, um, I think that premium is evaporating relatively quickly now, um, uh, but capital remains available. And then my, my, my last comment on the next slide is what's different uh, and, um, and, 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 and what, what can we expect reasonably in Australia for offshore wind? So what's different? A, what's different is the investment size. Uh, Australia has had a, had a very good run in developing onshore wind and solar over the last four or five years. But here, we will be talking about multiples in terms of um, capital needs. Um, we will move from a few hundred million dollars to a few billion dollars uh, for a single project. Um, uh, so that probably means that multiple financing sources will have to be considered. Um, you can relatively easily finance a, a 200 megawatt solar plant or a 300 megawatt onshore wind farm in Australia with a group of banks uh, in, in a single market. Um, if you need to raise three, four, five, six billion um, for a new asset class, it is likely uh, that multiple sources of financing might be required and ha might have to be coordinated together. 
uh, export credit agencies could actually play a role again as liquidity enabler. And, and we expect some of that to happen in possibly in Japan as well. So, so we might see a different pattern here with export credit agencies moving from just being a, a political risk mitigator to being a liquidity enabler in new markets for new asset classes. Second thing that's important is partnerships. Um, the, this is an industry where partnerships will be essential on the equity side. Um, uh, there is a body of knowledge that exists among international investors. Orsted, Copenhagen Infrastructure Partner, WPD have all developed a body of knowledge in developing projects. This is also a sector that's of high interest for financial investors, pension funds um, uh, that are typically uh, favoring developed countries and long-term assets. This is a sweet spot for them. So partnerships will matter. And then what can we learn um, from the other markets? Um, uh, if we look at Taiwan, as many as nine export credit agencies have been providing liquidity to the sector to date. Denmark, Norway, Belgium, the Netherlands, the UK, Germany, Korea, Japan, uh, all have provided liquidity to the sector. So that, that is something to keep in mind as the industry develops um, in, in, in Australia. So I'll leave it at that in the interest of time. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions. Many thanks. Yes, many thanks for the great presentation, Daniel. And there are some questions from our registers. Yeah, we can see it on the slide. The first one is, what will be the typical financing for, for Australia's offshore wind projects in the next three to five years? Uh, sure. So uh, as, I, as I mentioned in the presentation, I think it will be a bit of a combination of, of financing sources. Um, uh, there is one distinguishing factor in Australia compared to other markets is, is the uh, the, the tenor of the financing tends to be on the shorter end of the spectrum in Australia. Australia is more of a five, maybe seven year market, uh, whereas in, in Taiwan, um, you know, the financings are 16 to 18 years, the longer term financings. In Japan, it's an even longer term financing. So there, has, there will have to be some sort of combination uh, between um, what's the sweet spot for Australian banks, uh, what can the international bank market provide, and then whether there is a merit in involving export credit agencies as an enabler. So it's likely to be a combination of multiple sources of financing. Okay. Um, the second question is the similarities and the difference between Australia's offshore wind projects and the other projects in Asia in your portfolio. Um, yeah, and we, we don't know yet, right? We haven't seen an offshore wind project in Australia yet. Um, so, so how will it be structured um, remains to be seen a little bit. Um, but again, I think it will have, on the financing side at least, um, the key will be to maximize liquidity in the domestic market. Um, uh, so I think it will have to be structured in such a way to be made palatable uh, to, to not only the international market, but also the local banks. So it's likely to be a little bit different in the sense that uh, it, it's probably more likely to be a construction financing, uh, maybe a seven-year maturity uh, with a large balloon at the end of the term, uh, rather than a fully amortizing long-term financing. But time will tell as the first uh, project comes to market. Okay, the next question is, some people say supply chain localization will be the most important issue to reduce the cost of offshore wind projects in Australia. Do you agree? It, it will be a factor. The costs will come down. Uh, the costs will come down over time. We are, we are already seeing it in Taiwan. Uh, we will see it in Japan. We have seen it in, in Western Europe. There's always a premium. Uh, from a cost standpoint to get a, an industry started. And that's what will happen in Australia. Uh, if Star of the South is the first project out of the gate, um, uh, that will set a high mark. Uh, and, and, and as the industry develops, as, as um, some of the fixed costs can be amortized over a, a larger number of projects, the costs will, will come down. The supply chain localization will be a contributor. Um, we are also seeing that in Taiwan, it will not be the only factor, but it will be a contributor. 
Okay, the last question is, uh, which type of wind technology you would prefer in Australia's project killing or floating? Yeah, that's an interesting question. And I think there's two answers to that. One is a technical answer and one is a financing answer. Um, uh, clearly on the, on, on the technical side, it's gonna be a little bit site specific. You know, so, some, some areas will be better suited for fixed bottom. Uh, others will be better suited for floating, uh, floating offshore wind. Um, so that will be driven, that decision will be driven largely by technical considerations. On the financing side, um, the vast majority, uh, the, the, almost everything that's been financed to date uh, in Taiwan, in Japan, in Western Europe, all over the world, is fixed bottom. Um, that is the technology that is now well understood, uh, well accepted uh, by uh, financial institutions. Floating offshore will happen. Um, as I said, Korea in particular is a market that will be conducive. Uh, Japan is likely to be a conducive market. Uh, France, for that matter, is likely to be a conducive market uh, for floating offshore. But it will be a bit of an evolution uh, in the asset class. Um, and uh, you know, today, uh, it hasn't really been done on a commercial scale or hasn't been financed on a commercial scale. So we have done some work on, on financeability of floating offshore. Um, we've advised on a couple of projects in Europe um, because we, we, we sense that it's coming uh, and we sense that there will be a need for the financing markets to, uh, uh, to cross that hurdle at some point, but the hurdle has not been crossed yet. So purely as a banker, as a lender, uh, for a, a first project in a new country like Australia, in a new jurisdiction, fixed bottom is probably the easier way to go. And as the industry develops, it can morph into floating as that technology becomes better understood uh, by financiers. Yeah. Okay, so um, actually, we, uh, Daniel, I, I saw a lot of questions from the Q&A box, but uh, um, most about, mostly about in Asia. So, um, and uh, we, we do not have any more time to for answering questions, but you can answer their questions online in the Q&A box. Happy to do that. I'll, I'll, I will take a look at the Q&A box and I'm happy to, uh, to provide some answers. Okay, thank you. Thank you for then uh, for, your good an for, you. for your good answer and your presentation. Yes, and um, Many thanks again for our respectful speakers' presentations and good answering. And I hope all of the attendees can learn a lot from today's webinar, uh, whatever from the uh, Australia's wind power potentials and also the lessons from the Asia. And additionally, I'm delighted to announce that the super early birthday two of Australia Wind Energy 2021, which is 30% off, is available due. 16th October and uh, the Australia Wind Energy 2021 is a premier information exchange and the business networking platform between multiple stakeholders in this country's wind battle chain and today's show is estimated to attract more than 500 industry stakeholders representing Australia federal and state governments, domestic and international investors, utilities, financials, EPCs, as well as key equipment and solution providers. And at last, no worry about the presentation slides and recordings. They will be shared by email link within one week. And thank you again for all of you, the participation. See you next time.